Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them, everybody say all. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Father, I pray in Jesus' name today as we tackle some things about the baptism in the Holy Spirit that you would initiate and reveal and speak clearly to hearts and minds and spirits today, God, that we would hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pray because I think this is such an important piece of living a life with the Lord, of understanding the power available to you and to me through the baptism in the Holy Spirit, okay? It's such a huge thing that in most circles, in many circles, many churches, many denominations, has been relegated to the sideline or dismissed completely, put aside as if it's not a piece of the New Testament church. In fact, I said it before and I'll say it again, the only church we see in the New Testament is a Pentecostal, spirit-filled church. There is no other kind of church in the New Testament. In fact, when Paul goes to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, there was a group of people that believed there and they had begun that process. They'd been taught by a great uh, disciple named Apollos and he had really poured into their life and shared things of of God with them and they were hungry and excited and Paul shows up on the scene and and he says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And and what I want you to hear from that is it was a normal, natural progression of experience that the first century church and many, many churches since then have experienced. It was a natural thing. Paul asked them that question like, you should have received the Holy Spirit already. That's just normal. It's just sort of what happens in our lives. And they said to him, they said, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. No one's told us about the Holy Spirit. And so the apostle Paul breaks it down for them. And I just want you to know at this time, the book of Acts hadn't been written there was no doctrinal statements about the Holy Spirit. There was no, nobody had written theologically about what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is or what speaking in tongues was or what, you know, we call that the Greek words glossolalia. There you go, another Greek word for you. You know, nobody had, how I many of you know nobody had written that? There was no New Testament when Paul showed up in Ephesus. He was living the New Testament. Think about that. Paul couldn't say, turn in your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Paul couldn't say that. So all they had to go on were two things, what the Holy Spirit was speaking to them and sharing into their life, and what they were experiencing with the Holy Spirit. That's all they had to go on. They didn't have any doctrinal statements there. The Holy Spirit is not a concept in the Old Testament. There is no concept of the Holy Spirit in the way that we see him today or we see him in the New Testament. So uh, as Paul shows up or even as, as the, the disciples on the day of Pentecost is what we just read in Acts 2, as they experience the power of the Holy Spirit and the supernatural life-altering power that came that day in the upper room, they had no theological framework, no doctrinal statements, no 16 fundamental truths. They had nothing to go on except what God had shown them and what he had spoken to them. And yet they moved and experienced the power of God. What's my point? You don't have to understand all the things about God or clearly get all the theological nuances of the things that people have written over the last 2000 years to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. In fact, in many cases, those things are hindrances, not helps. God knew that without power, God knew that without the Holy Spirit in filling and indwelling a believer and overflowing in a believer's life, we would never get through not only life and the persecution and the trials and the difficulties that came the disciples' way and has certainly come our way, but he knew that we would never, never gather the harvest. We would never do the work of the kingdom around the world for God's kingdom to advance. 
That day, the day of Pentecost, Peter, who no, no doubt 50 days before, 50 days before, that's not even two months before, denied that he even knew Jesus three times. Scared to death of what might happen to him, trying to preserve his own life, said, I don't know who that guy is. I'm not with him. I don't know anything about him, even though everybody knew he was lying. Peter gets up after being filled with the Holy Spirit among the same people, the same people, and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and gives an altar call, and 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people respond and give their heart to the Lord. And if you read the end of chapter 2, the Spirit-filled church was so prolific and so powerful that, that two things happened. God added daily to their number. In other words, people were being saved every single day. How many of you know they didn't have church every day? That means people were being saved in the marketplace. People were being saved at the trade store. People were being saved at the schools. People were being saved outside of the church. God was adding daily. How many of you know that's the normal way the church, a spirit-filled church, should operate? I love it when people get saved here and six people gave their heart to Jesus last Sunday. Praise the Lord. I love it. But you know what's real powerful? When you lead people to Jesus in your workplace and in your school. I mean, even Walmart has unsaved people. That was funny. I think that's more powerful even when people get saved at church. And now what was happening to the church, that's the first thing the Holy Spirit was doing, that he was adding daily to their number. He was working in their heart. The second thing that the Holy Spirit was doing is he was bringing such a sense of community and joy and life and giving and miracles and power and all those things that most Christians say that they want in their life. He was bringing that sense to the church because they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. He says they were all filled. Now, I don't think there's shame for people who aren't filled, but I do think we want you to be filled. Something powerful happened. So what is this thing, the Holy Spirit? What is this thing of the baptism and the Holy Spirit? And so what I want to do this morning is I want to try to answer six questions that people have about the Holy Spirit, and the bapti particularly the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I feel like we've covered who he is. We've covered last Sunday how he works in the world, like what his job is in the world. And today, I want to cover this idea of what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? How does God do the baptism? What is that thing for? And we're going to do that by answering six questions about the baptism. So here's number one. Why do we still believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Why do we still believe? This morning, I spent about 30 minutes reading theology. I know that sounds exciting on a Sunday morning, but I spent 30 minutes reading theology about what we call cessationists. Cessationists are people who believe that the work of the Spirit, the uh, miracle, working of miracles, prophecy, tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, all the gifts of the Spirit that we see in the New Testament, they believe somewhere between the death of the Apostle John at the end of the first century and the beginning of the third century, the fourth century, when the, the Bible was finalized at the Council of Nicaea, they believe somewhere in those 300 years or 200 years, all of that stuff ended. That the Holy Spirit doesn't heal, heal people. Sometimes God sovereignly heals, heals people, but they don't believe that God ministers healing through the laying on of hands. They wouldn't believe that prophecy would have. So everything basically that happened this morning in our worship, they would say, none of that is God. All of that is human emotion. All that is fake. You've got one camp that believes that. You've got another camp called continuationists. That's a fancy word, continuationists. And they believe it never ended. They believe that the gifts of the church to the church, you know, the, the, the callings of God, the gifts of the Spirit, the moving of the Holy Spirit, certainly the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that all those things continue even into today. They're still happening today all over the world. You know what? One of my favorite things happened two weeks ago. A Baptist came out and said, you know what? I pray in the Spirit. I speak in tongues. Most of my prayer, he said, most of, this is Max Lucado. He said, most of my prayer time is spent praying in the Spirit. Ha ha, you know, it's like, 
What, what, that was a, I, I, I like Max Lucado. I'm not mad at Max Lucado. I just think that's amazing. For years and years and years, we've heard stories of missionaries from other denominations and even our own, who, who or, you know, but particularly like in the Baptist realm or the Presbyterian realm or the Nazarene realm, and they go around the world and they go to these nations where nobody's saved and they try to do ministry and they recognize that apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, they can do nothing in the, in the nation to which God has called them. I mean, you want to see China get saved? It's not going to happen through good strategy. It's going to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. You want to see Muslims come to Christ? It's not going to happen through great programs and great printed material. It's going to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no other way for those people. In fact, the Lord right now in the Muslim world is working around us because maybe we're not as spirit-filled as we need to be, and Jesus is just appearing to Muslims all the time. They call him the man in white. And it's like he's saying, you know, if you guys were more baptized in the Holy Spirit, I could do something. But since you're not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just send Jesus to appear, just like he did to, to, uh, uh, on the road to Damascus to the Apostle Paul. That's pretty cool. You're like, well, how come he doesn't do that for me? Because you're sitting in the church and you, <laughs> you believe. Remember what Jesus said? Blessed are those who have never seen and yet believe. You're blessed that you've never seen and have believed. But I love that the Holy Spirit's still doing those kinds of things. Why do we believe, still believe that baptism exists? Well, it's happening all over the world. It's happening in America. It's happening in every nation around the world. There are over 800 million spirit-filled believers across the globe. We are outnumbered only by Catholics. I think there's still two billion Catholics. They believe in the next 10 to 15 years, the spirit-filled believers around the world will exceed 1 billion spirit-filled believers. We are the only and the fastest growing brand of Christianity in the world. Pentecostal churches are still seeing communities transformed, healings, miracles, the activity of God in every aspect of life and ministry. In fact, in this very church, in the last 60 days, we've seen healing, we've seen transformation, we've seen people saved, we've seen people filled. It's, it's happening all around us. Why do we believe? Because we see it with our own eyes. We see what God is doing around the world. Second question I want to answer, what exactly is the baptism of the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit? What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, here's the Pentecostal definition the baptism of the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit, depends how you want to say it, is a significant additional power for life and ministry given by God subsequent, that means following salvation. It is additional significant power for life and ministry given by God subsequent to salvation. Now, if God came down and said, if you're not spirit-filled and God came down, or if you are, whatever, God came down and he said, guys, I got great news for you. Uh, You're trying to live your life for God. You're struggling with this sin. You're struggling with this thing, the fruit of the spirit, whatever, you you know, fulfill your call. I got great news. All you've got to do is take this gift I'm going to give you, and I'm going to give you power to do all those things. I mean, you think that'd be a pretty good idea. Well, that's exactly what he did. Remember what Jesus said, it is good if I go away because the Holy Spirit will come to you and he will fill you and guide you and all these things. And so the Holy Spirit baptism in our lives is that additional power we need for life. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is really the third baptism in a sequence of events. The first is being baptized into Jesus for salvation. It's being, now that's not like we think of baptism like in water, that's the second, but the first is like being baptized into Christ. It's, it's that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you become saved and you're baptized, if you will, into Jesus. The second is being baptized in water. And we believe in both of those experiences, that you need to be saved, and then we want to baptize you in water. If you want to be baptized in water, we're doing that on the 30th of October, probably not outside, Probably inside, just to help nobody get pneumonia or whatever. But it could be 70 degrees. We'll see. Just kidding. We'll do it inside. But if you want to be baptized, here's here's why. Because there's a really important biblical pattern to being filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we can see over and over again that people were saved 
They received the baptism of Christ for salvation. They were baptized in water, and then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes it happened out of order. It's not that it never happens out of order. But in the Bible, and what we're hearing from missionaries around the world, is there is a significant correlation between people who have been baptized in, this, in water to, be, to receiving and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't understand it. I can't explain to you why God honors that, but God honors that. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and then receive the Holy Spirit. So I'm not telling you that is a hard and fast rule because I know many people that have never been baptized in water but have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Totally true. But I think that God does honor that pattern. And so if you've been asking God to fill you with the Holy Spirit and you've not received, but you've neither been baptized in water since you believed, since you got saved, or since you came back to the Lord, maybe you should consider taking that step so that you can then receive the Holy Spirit. I think there's something to that. What is the Holy Spirit? It's the third baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Too many of us get stuck on speaking in tongues. We think that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Can I just say to you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. Does it have something to do with speaking in tongues? Sure. The official Assemblies of God position, we're in Assemblies of God Church, the official Assemblies of God doctrine is that speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence. We call it IPE or initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we believe uh, because of the pattern in the book of Acts that when you receive the Holy Spirit for the very first time, the first thing that will happen to you, can I say first thing, not only thing? Can I say that? The first thing, not only thing, that will happen to you is you will likely speak in a heavenly language or another tongue as the Holy Spirit carries you on. We'll talk about that just in a second, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. I do want to ask a sub-question here. Do I have to speak in tongues to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? How many of you are thinking that? Like four of you. Good. Do I have to speak in tongues? Good, that's for you, four. Do I have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, let me step aside from my assemblies of God. Where's my, where's my credential card? Let me, don't, Chad McAtee, if you're listening, stop listening. My gut says no. Because I think there are people around the world serving God in places that are difficult, as we already mentioned, who may, who may not pray in, the, in a heavenly language but are absolutely filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me caveat, because let me say this. Do I think we should? Yes. Do I think that a believer who is baptized in the Holy Spirit should speak in tongues? In other words, not set it aside as an unessential? Yes, I think you should you should believe it, you should seek it, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, and you, sh you should desire to, to speak in your heavenly language and understand the things of God in that way. Do I think that you must or you're never filled with the Holy Spirit? I can't get there. Not all the way. Now, I will say the reason we believe it's the initial evidence is that is the pattern in the book of Acts. So we'll get to that in just a second. Let me just, let me just say one more thing. It's important to speak in tongues. Is it the most important thing of the baptism? Absolutely not. How many of you have known somebody who speaks in tongues but is a real jerk to everybody else? That doesn't add up, does it? It ought to be different than that. And here's one of the mistakes I think people make in the baptism. They seek the manifestation of speaking in tongues instead of speak, uh, seek the giver of the gift. Can I just say, when you're, when you're asking the Holy Spirit to fill you, whether it's for the first time or, or you know, the first of, of a million times, don't ever seek the manifestation. Don't ever seek the experience. Seek the giver. The giver is, is what you want, not the experience. So uh, it is the power of God. Here's how Jesus put it about the baptism. I think this is a great definition. What is the baptism? On the last and great, is in John chapter seven, the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, verse 39, he meant the spirit 
the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. See how it's a normal, it's like a normative experience that God is saying. He's setting us up to say, hey, this isn't a weird thing. It's not a Pentecostal thing. It's not a charismatic thing. It's not a thing for a fringe group of Christians. It is a normal thing for the church. Those who believe should receive. And up to that point, though, the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not been glorified. That is the Holy Spirit. It's what is already inside of you, welling up inside of you, and streams of living water flowing from within you so that you are strengthened and encouraged. Number three, why did God choose tongues? Why did God choose tongues? Well, let me just say first, I have no idea. There's no scripture or sidebar where God says, let me just explain to you why I chose tongues. Okay? There's nothing like that. But I do think there are four ideas here. Four ideas. First of all, confirmation. Why did God choose tongues? Because he wanted a way to confirm to us that the Holy Spirit had in fact filled us to overflowing in that third baptism and we are now operating in a new place or a new level of serving Christ that we uh, previously did not experience. It's the initial evidence. Here's where tongues are found in the New Testament. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10 at Cornelius' house, and Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus. Now, are there other instances of people being filled with the Holy Spirit? Sure. Can I just tell you one other uh, sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit that is common? So like we've got four places, I think, that talk about tongues. Three of those places also talk about prophecy. That they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Prophecy is a understandable thing. So I'm just saying it's confirmation. Acts chapter 2, they were at least some of them were speaking in known languages. Have you ever heard the stories of people who were in a meeting and, and they were totally lost, but may, or maybe they, they were from another country and somebody would give a message in tongues and that message in tongues was the language that they spoke? You ever heard stories like that? That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Remember what the guys and gals who were in the street said? He said, these dudes are speaking the things of God in our language. And they don't know our language. They're just unlearned people from Galilee, but they're speaking these other languages. How do they do that? It's a spiritual phenomenon, right? Now, can God, so can God do that? Absolutely. He does do that to our lives, and it's a confirmation that he is among us. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14 that tongues are for a sign, a confirmation to those who do not believe, so they know God is among you. Everybody with me? I know you're riveted right now. Number two, it's not only for confirmation, it's for adoration. Tongues is used to worship God when we pray in the spirit, when we sing in the spirit. It is a form of worship to the Lord that he receives his worship. And so sometimes you don't have a good thing to say. You can't think about what you ought to be worshiping or praying or thinking. And so we pray in the spirit or we worship in the spirit and it's an adoration to the Lord. The third purpose of the baptism or the third uh, reason that God chose tongues is edification. It encourages. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that when I pray in an unknown tongue, when I pray in my heavenly language, my spirit prays, my, my brain, my thinking. So you engineers, this is hard for you, okay? But my thinking is unedified. Like you think you got to think your way through it, but you can't think your way through it. And Paul says your thinking is unedified, but your spirit is built up. Your spirit is encouraged. Your spirit is strengthened, even though your mind has no idea. So it's for edification. It edifies the person who is praying. If it's a gift of tongues, then it edifies the whole body of Christ. If someone had a gift of tongues, they would, uh, if they had courage, they would stand in a church service and they would pray that tongue out loud to the Lord. And the Bible tells us that someone else would interpret that tongue. And Paul says, if nobody interprets, you shut your face. Why does he say that? Because he's trying to like keep us reasonable. Have you ever met somebody that was a, like a Jedi, like a spiritual Jedi? And sometimes these people are like, like ooh, they're out there, right? They're, they think different, they act different, they have different thoughts about it. And they will just speak in tongues all over the world. And everywhere they are, every place they are, they're prophesying, they're speaking, all these things. And Paul's like, guys, we've got to do things in order. We've got to do it right. 
So, you know, my philosophy is this. If God gives us a tongue, there better be an interpretation. There better be an interpretation. And the Bible says if no one interprets, you should pray that God tells you what was said. Does that, does that make sense? So there's two kinds of tongues. I just want to be clear. There is your personal prayer language tongue where you can pray and worship God on your own. And then there's what we call the gift of tongues, which is what operates in the corporate body. Now, since I've been here, we've not had a message in tongues and interpretation on a Sunday morning. Okay, but I'm asking God, Paul said, desire these gifts. Now, I don't want that to freak anybody out. I don't want you to. And here's my promise to you. I'll never let it get out of hand. I am not afraid to put my loving arms around someone. Okay, I just, here's why I say that. Because I believe the church has to know that somebody's going to guard the gates. And if somebody's guarding the gates, we can let the Holy Spirit do whatever he wants. We can just move and, and, and follow and live within what the Holy Spirit's doing because we don't have to be afraid of something going haywire or you know whatever happening because somebody's guarding the gate. I'm going to guard the gates. I believe that's the call of the pastor. I'm going to guard the gates. I'm going to make sure that what's done in this room or any other room where we gather is done decently and in order and in the right place and the right moment and the right time. So we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to come in here worried about somebody getting out of hand because it's not going to happen. I'm going to take care of it. Does that make sense? I just want you to know that. I want you to know that. It's for edification. And lastly, it's for intercession. Romans 8 says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, so the Spirit prays through us. Have you ever uh, woke up one day or, or through the course of the day just in your spirit knew something wasn't right? You didn't know what it was. Maybe God put somebody on your heart, a loved one or a friend, and you didn't know what was going on, but you just felt like something's off. I don't know what it is. That's, first of all, a gift of the Spirit called discernment that the Lord is giving you. And number two, when we pray for that person in the Holy Spirit, we're praying the perfect will of God. When you intercede in the Spirit, you are praying the perfect will of God. You are taking out your human bias. You're taking out your own desires and your own will and your own idea. And you are yielding all that to the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says when we pray in an unknown tongue, the Spirit prays through us the perfect will of God. How many of you want the perfect will of God? Now, I, knew, I usually want the perfect will of God. Sometimes I want my will. Anybody with me? So sometimes I'll come to God and I'll just pray what I want. Hey, let your request be made known unto God, right? But when my spirit prays, it doesn't pray what Jeff wants. It prays what the Father wants. And what I can be assured of, of is his ways are not going to be my ways and his thoughts are not going to be my thoughts. But his ways are better than my ways and his thoughts are better than my thoughts. And he's going to work everything for the good of me because I love him. Does that make sense? So you can pray in the spirit and God, like, man, if you're ever like, I don't know what my career should be. You know, I'm just really struggling. Like, what do, what do I do? What do I, what do I study? What should my major be? What should I go after? I'm bored in my, your midlife. I'm bored in my career. I want a new career. What do I do? Well, God might have a plan for you and you don't know what it is or even how to pray it, but your spirit does. And so praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in our heavenly language in tongues. Why did God choose tongues? Because he gave us a way that we could pray the will of God into our life without knowing what the will of God is. That was actually really good, what I just said right there. That's not even in my notes. I just made it up right now. <laughs> he gave us a way to pray the perfect will of God when we don't even know what the will of God is. That's the power of praying in the Holy Spirit. Number four, I think. Am I not number four? Yep. What is the purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Why should I seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I think there's five main purposes, and I'm going to move quickly through these if you want to write them down. I also think the notes are on the Bible app. Number one, a spirit-filled believer can hear God's voice. A spirit-filled believer can hear God's voice. It doesn't mean an unfilled believer can't hear God's voice. It just means for a spirit-filled believer, it is easier to hear the voice of the Lord because you train your ear through the spirit to listen to what God is saying, to hear 
what the Lord is saying. A spirit-filled believer can more effectively hear the voice of the Lord. Number two, a spirit-filled believer can not only hear the voice of the Lord, but can discern the voice of the Lord. Why is that important? I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there's a whole lot of voices in the world. Which one's God's? You ever get confused in your own mind which voice is God's and which voice is yours? Yeah, the Holy Spirit helps us discern. Here's the other reason the discerning God's voice is so important, because listening and hearing are two different things. Right? How many of you men listen to your wife, but sometimes you don't hear your wife? Boys, don't do that when you get married. You listen to your wife. Well, can we listen to God but not hear God? It's why the Bible says that faith doesn't come by listening to the word of God. It comes by hearing the word of God. Hearing implies understanding and thinking and putting it deep inside of our soul. So look, if you want to not just listen to the voice of the Lord, you want to hear the voice of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit helps you do that. Number three, a spirit-filled believer lives a life by the Spirit. By the Spirit. By the Spirit. Not around the Spirit. Not through the Spirit. Not on the side of the Spirit. You live your life by the Spirit, and this is huge. Paul writes in Galatians 5, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Can I just say how massive that, that sentence is? You want to stop sinning? You want to stop cr- compromising? You want to stop washing left and right of your walk with God and one day you're really great and the other day you're a mess and the next day you're good. You want to stop being tossed back and forth? Live by the Spirit. You want to learn how to stop gossiping? Live by the Spirit. You want to learn how to stop lusting? Live by the Spirit. You want to learn how to stop lying? Live by the Spirit. Oh, we could read a whole list. There's 17 of them listed in this passage. And maybe we will read them. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. That's quite a list. You want to figure out how to destroy those things in your life, destroy the work, of this, the work of the enemy in your life, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with one another so that you do not do what you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, if you live by the, can I hammer that even more? Like, it, live by the Spirit. It's the power of the baptism. Number four, a spirit-filled believer produces fruit. Well, if you're not going to produce the acts of the sinful nature, how about we produce the acts of, or, or the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How you doing with those? It's a real deal, right? If we're going to exchange the works of our flesh and live by the Spirit, then we're going to give room for the Holy Spirit to produce in us the fruit of the Spirit. So I don't care how much you talk in tongues. I don't care how much you prophesy. If there's no fruit of the Spirit in your life, as far as I'm concerned, you're not full of the Spirit. And, I, and the same is true for Jeff. And there are moments, <laughs> right? How many of you can relate? There are moments. You know, the thought I always had was this. You know, you, you could prophesy, you can speak in tongues. Well, you know, how awesome am I? Yeah, I'll just remind you that God did the same thing through a donkey. I don't think that he puts those spiritual things on such a high pedestal as we might. You know what he does count on? Living by the Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit can be active in your life. 
live by the Spirit. And the last purpose of the baptism is this. A Spirit-filled believer, a truly Spirit-filled believer, not only will live by the Spirit and, and have the fruit of the Spirit happening in their life, they will be active in the harvest fields. They will be active in the harvest fields. In fact, if you read Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus told them the Spirit was coming, he said the number one primary purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit was so that they would have power to be the witnesses around the world of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A Spirit-filled believer will be in tune enough with the Holy Spirit to recognize the harvest fields all around them and engage the harvest fields. How do we do that? Well, prophecy and healing and ministering reconciliation and telling our story and letting the Holy Spirit guide and direct every step and every moment of our life. Many of you, as soon as this service is over, after you talk to the missionary, you will go to lunch somewhere and if you're spirit filled, you'll listen to the Holy Spirit who might have you run into some old colleague that you had years ago. And maybe that's not an accident that you both showed up at McAllister's on the same day. You haven't seen him in 20 years. Maybe that's the Lord leading you to minister reconciliation to somebody. Does that make sense? Look, if God can take Philip and have him witness to an Ethiopian eunuch on the side of the road and then disappear him to another place, I think he can use you and me to talk to somebody about Jesus in our life. It's the primary point of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It isn't tongues. It is sharing our faith in the harvest fields. And can I just say, if you're not living by the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit is not active in your life, please don't tell people that you follow Jesus. Take that fish sticker off your car. Man, that sounded mean. I didn't mean that mean, but. Number five, I'm, I'm gonna go quick, I promise. The kids workers are ready. Why would anyone who believes in God, believes in the Lord, not desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Why would, they, why would someone not desire? I can only think of a few reasons. I, I can only think of this, because you're afraid of tongues. You're afraid of speaking in tongues. You're afraid of giving the Holy Spirit control so that you can, he can speak through you and pray through you. Or maybe because you don't understand God's desires and God's plan. Maybe because you're afraid of it. Maybe because, and I think this is a legitimate thing, maybe because if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, God might have some other plans for your life than you have for your life, and he might tell you what those are and ask you to do them, and then you're like, look, I got a degree in electrical engineering. And God says, yeah, I'm going to use that in Africa. I think a lot of people don't seek the Lord in that way because of that very reason. They're afraid of what God is going to ask them to do. They're like, if I get filled with the Holy Spirit and get all lovey and joy and peaceful and all these things, God's going to take me somewhere and ask me to do things for the kingdom of God. I got a plan. I think, <laughs> one, I think you might be right. God might ask you to do something. But I tell you, there's no other way to live. There's no other way to live. And the last thing is this. How can I be filled with the Spirit? I hope that it is your desire to be filled and then refilled and then filled again. I hope that, tomorrow, I hope that if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will pray in the Spirit today and you'll pray in the Spirit tomorrow and you'll pray in the Spirit even on Thursday. And that you will pray in this, and you will live in the Spirit, and you will live by the Spirit, and you will live with the fruit. I, I pray for me and for you, and for I pray those things for us. But the only way to get there is to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. So, how do you do that? How do you be filled with the Spirit? First, be saved. And I just want to say it clearly unless you are a follower of Jesus, this experience, this living is not available to you. God does not fill pagans with the Holy Spirit. God does not fill sinners with the Holy Spirit. Only redeemed sinners who have acknowledged Christ and been baptized in that first baptism. Number two, 
Be saved. Number two, seek the filler, not the manifestations, not the tongues, not the experience. It is not so you can feel better about yourself or so that, you know, well, I just don't feel like it today. That's not the way this goes. We're not trying to speak in tongues. We're not asking God uh, to, to do something so we feel better about our life. We're asking God to give us a wonderful gift that he has promised to all who believe to be filled with the Spirit. So who do we seek in this? What do we seek? We seek him. We seek the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. We seek the power of God to know us better, to know him better, to know the things that God has planned for our life. We don't seek the manifestations or the tongues. It is not about speaking in tongues, though I believe that will happen to you. Number three, you gotta be saved. You gotta seek the filler. Number three, you cannot doubt. I think one of the great hindrances when people come to receive the Holy Spirit is this. They come and they're so afraid to speak in tongues because they think it will be them. Well, it'll just be, how do I know it's me and not the Holy Spirit? Well, how do you know it's the Holy Spirit and not you? So doubting is this. Doubt, not doubting is this. It's called faith. It's called believing that if God begins to speak that and you begin to feel that. And I, don't, I can't describe how it happens. It just sort of bubbles out over you and you just feel it and, you know, and it's not going to sound like me and it's not going to sound like Deanne. It's not going to sound like your parents. It's not going to sound like whoever you've ever heard pray in the spirit. It's not going to sound like anybody. Guess what it's going to sound like? You. It's going to sound a lot like you. And God's going to speak through you in that moment, but you can't doubt but believe. Number four, Oftentimes people will come to receive the Holy Spirit and God is asking them to surrender. That there are parts of the parts that you guys can play. I'll go faster if you play. God will bring something up in your life that he wants you to deal with. He'll bring up a piece of unforgiveness or he'll be he'll bring up a piece of sin that you've that you've been indulging. He'll bring up something in your life often, not always, but often that he wants you to deal with. And the idea is this, God wants to correct and work on and fix and uh, de develop those parts of our life so that we can be really in alignment. It's hard to walk by the Spirit with unforgiveness in our heart. Right? It's hard to walk by the Spirit with unconfessed sin in our heart. It's hard to, uh, to uh, walk by the Spirit with hatred towards an ex-spouse in our heart. We've got to let the Holy Spirit heal those things and work on those things so we can receive. So when God speaks to you and says, hey, I want you to surrender this thing, it probably won't be a surprise to you what he says. I mean, it won't come out of left field like I had no idea that I had unforgiveness towards my father. You'll, you already know. He just wants to work on it with you because he loves you so much. He wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And lastly, number five is it's just this. Chillax. Is that a real word? Chillax. Like, chill out, dude. Like, like don't get all, oh, you know. <laughs> I don't even know what those, stressed out and anxious. And uh, I know for Chloe, she's not in here, so I can tell a story about her. I know for Chloe, it was really hard because uh, to receive the baptism because every time she would, she came over, she came forward so many times to receive. And every time she'd come forward, she would just psych herself out and she would get nervous and anxious. Like, is it going to happen today? And, you know, and she just, I, it was just a mess. And finally, I um, had a young, young evangelist come in named Tim Inlow, who will be at youth convention this year. If your kids haven't signed up for youth convention, they should go. Uh, if, you, if you could do it. And uh, anyway, Tim Inlow came and he just had a way of making her feel comfortable. And she relaxed or chillaxed. And just like that, she received the baptism of the Spirit. So I'm just saying to you, like, like don't, don't let your mind and your anxiousness and your nerves and your emotions get in the way. Just relax. And in his timing, in his way, in his, in his moment, you'll receive. It's that simple. Does that make sense? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you first for the baptism of the Holy Spirit that changes our life, that empowers us, that strengthens us. God, that does all the things. And Lord, I know that there are some here today that need to receive it, God. And God, want, want you to move and work in their heart and in their life. 
And Lord, my prayer this morning, God, just as they have this moment, this opportunity, Lord, that this doesn't have to be complicated, this doesn't have to be long and drawn out, God, but this can be a moment where they just simply relax, trust you, and receive. In Jesus' name, God, may it be done. I want to ask everyone to stand to your feet this morning. And I want to do this. Would you just stretch your hands towards the Lord right now? Whether you've been filled before, never been filled, this is the first time, would you just ask the Holy Spirit to refill you or to fill you for the very first time? If you have a heavenly language, you can begin to pray in the heavenly language. If you haven't, trust the Lord. And as that those those syllables and those thoughts, those things begin to come to your throat. Just begin in faith to speak them out loud. You can't say them in your head. Say them out loud. And just let the Holy Spirit pray through you. Would you do that right now? God, we worship your name. We bless you. And Lord, I just simply pray right now that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit. God, we, we don't want... Got to just uh, uh, go through the motions of Christianity, but we want to live a spirit-filled life by the Spirit for the kingdom of God. Lord, with the fruit of the Spirit and the anointing of God. So Lord, right now, everybody who's asking, would you just would you just fill them right now? Right now, I just say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Begin to speak in a heavenly language. Begin to let the Holy Spirit pray that through you. Don't worry about if it's you. Don't worry and wonder what God is saying. Just let the Holy Spirit speak through you right now. In Jesus' name, come on. Come on, church, let's pray. Just for a couple of moments this morning, let's allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. Thank you, Lord. 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 Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled. As the Lord is bringing things to you that you need to work on or put underneath his blood, would you do that right now? Father, help us to forgive. Help us to walk away from sin. Help us to live a life of holiness, God. Help us to begin to walk with you, God. Those things you might be speaking to our heart, Lord, that we would push them aside and set them aside in Jesus' name for your glory. I don't want anything to be in the way, God of praying and worshiping in the Spirit of God, walking and living by the Spirit in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. 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 Bless 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 you, Lord. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask the worship team to sing. If you want to seek the Lord some more, man, if you need to receive from the Lord, you need to be refilled, I want to open our altars. Would you come and just find a place? I'd encourage you to not kneel, but to stand boldly and strong before God and just ask Him to fill you or refill you. Some of you need a refilling of the Holy Spirit. So as they sing and as they lead us, would you come? The rest of us, let's worship the Lord. When you need to go, God bless you. You can slip out and get your kids and, and go on with your day. I love you. Have a great day. Let's worship the Lord. And if you need to come, would you come? Don't hesitate. Don't worry about what people will think. If you need to be filled or refilled with the Holy Spirit, would you come right now in Jesus' name?